Welcome to the last session of the last day, which is special because everybody here really, really wants to be here. So thank you for coming. We had a, we had a bet going, and uh, I won the bet because so many of you showed up. So I win. You win. We all win. All right. Um, just to get started, uh, as we're asking questions, interacting, remember this is part of the community. We have a code of conduct. It's there if you would like to read it in detail. Treat others well. We also have closed captioning available on the, the live stream. Uh, so for those who are watching, that's how you can access it. Uh, we will be having time for questions at the end. So for those in the room, well, there will be microphones. For those watching live, there's a Slack channel on the CNCF uh, Slack. So join that, and we'll take a look there as well. And then finally, thank you to the sponsor for the recordings. They're awesome at getting recordings up quick, uh, which we all appreciate uh, for reference. So this is the SIG Auth Deep Dive. I'm Jordan. This is David. This is Rita. Uh, we helped lead SIG Auth along with Mike Denise, who couldn't be here today, and Mo Khan, who is, I think, going to heckle us later during the question and answer period. Uh, so first of all, what, what is SIG Auth? Uh, what do we do? We are responsible for the parts of Kubernetes that uh, control authorization and authentication uh, to the API server and components in Kubernetes. And so this also includes other aspects like auditing and some policy, uh, and then some of the identity aspects that feed into those systems. Um, we have more sub projects now than we used to. Uh, that is good. Uh, if you would like to help and you're interested in one of these areas, uh, please check out the, uh, the SIGOF page on the community repo and find the people who are working on that. Uh, there are many areas where we can use, uh, use more eyes, use more hands. Uh, but some of those are audit, authenticators, authorizers, the certificates, so getting identity and then approving identities, uh, requests for identity, encryption at rest, which we'll hear a lot about from Rita today, uh, and then uh, some of the other uh, bits like policy management, pod security policy, which is no more, and uh, pod security admission, which is here, uh, things like that along with uh, some external projects like the CSI driver, uh, the secret store CSI driver. So those are just kind of an overview of the subprojects we have. Uh, today, we wanted to walk through sort of the current state of some of the enhancements we've been working on, things that graduated, things that are in flight, and things that are coming up. Um, so to start, graduated. Uh, many years ago, uh, when you would create a Kubernetes cluster, you'd get a secret for every service account, which would have a long-lived token in it. And this made us sad. Uh, and so we came up with a better way, which were these ephemeral tokens, but we still kind of had the old secret ones hanging around. And so we've been on a long, slow, careful rollout to get rid of those. Um, and so the first step was to just stop making the problem worse, stop continuing to create new ones. And so that Turned on by default in 124, it's graduated in 126. So from now on, when you create clusters, you don't get default tokens auto-generated. Uh, if you want them, you can still get them, but we're not gonna go like spray bad long-lived credentials into uh, secrets for you. So I graduated. Lots of things in flight. Um, there are other aspects of this token reduction work that we're, is still ongoing. We're still trying to uh, track when you're using existing ones and warn and add metrics so you can monitor use of those. And then eventually, eventually, if you haven't used them in a long, long time, uh, we will have the ability to clean up ones that just got created, haven't been used, uh, and are a security risk. So this is still ongoing. Uh, this is something that's been asked for a lot, the, the ability to ask Kubernetes, who am I? Uh, Kubernetes authentication is a little bit intricate. It can be a little bit complex. And so an API that actually lets you say, who, who am I? And have the server tell you who it thinks you are um, is a useful thing. This graduated beta in 127. It's a pretty straightforward, well understood API. So we expect that to reach GA in 128. And so then you would be able to say, kube control off, who am I? And it would tell you. With that, I'm going to hand it off to Rita, who's going to talk about some of the KMS enhancements. Awesome. Uh, show of hands who have used uh, KMS encryption v1. Just kind of. All right. Uh, I'm sorry. That's how you know you're you're getting better. Huh? 
oh, sorry, uh, that's how you know you're getting better. Um, so yeah, before we start talking about V2, um, I wanna kind of cover some of the enhancements we've added for both V1 and V2. Um, some things like, hey, for uh, data encryption, uh, we've moved on from AES, CBC to now GCM. Uh, so starting from 125, you actually get uh, right with GCM by default, um, and it could also fall back to CBC. Uh, and for KMS V2, it defaults to GCM. Um, and for folks who actually uh, have to rotate their secrets, uh, now you have dynamic reload, so you no longer need to restart your API server, yay. Um, and that, that you get in 126. Uh, and we get this question all the time is, wow, why couldn't I encrypt my custom resources? Well, now, now you can. Um, so now in 126, you can also uh, encrypt your custom resources. Uh, and last but not least, why can't I encrypt everything, right? Uh, so in 127, now you can. With wildcard support as well as wildcard group, you can actually encrypt all or uh, for all resources in a group. And here's an example of what the encryption configuration resource looks like uh, and a friendly panda. <laughs> All right, so before we talk about V2, um, so let's address the elephant in the room. Why not V1? What's wrong with V1? Um, well, to start off, um, for every encryption request that comes through, um, a new uh, data encryption key is actually generated every time. So now you might think, wow, that's a lot of uh, new generation because each uh, data encryption key means now I have to go talk to the KMS provider every single time. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, this meant a slow uh, cluster startup time, right? Uh, because every time you start restarting the server, that meant every single request actually went to the remote vault. Uh, and furthermore, most external KMS actually have rate limiting, right? Um, so on top of the extra hop and the network uh, latency, as well as rate limits, that roughly translates to about 160 milliseconds per request. So as you can imagine, this is not something most companies want. Um, and then let's talk about key rotation, right? Uh, earlier I mentioned uh, before 126, you would have had to restart your, uh, your API server just to get the updates from the configuration file. Uh, it was very manual and error prone. Um, and also because we didn't have enough health, uh, sorry, because we didn't have enough key IDs in the request itself, you actually didn't know what object used what key. So it was really hard for people to know uh, which key can I actually rotate without putting my workloads at risk, right? Um, and also, also for health check and status, uh, all of that was actually part of the encryption and decryption call. Um, so in order to get the status of your plugin, you actually had to make an encryption decryption call. Why? I don't know. Um, and then uh, we didn't have enough observability, right? So because there was no unique ID that actually did the correlation, so it's really hard to tell which request went through the API server, then the plugin, then the actual remote KMS, right? So all of that were basically the gaps in V1. And here comes V2, right? The idea behind V2 is we don't like those gaps and we want to make sure uh, Kubernetes can actually be uh, can actually offer something that is more production ready. Um, so starting alpha in 125, beta in 127, and targeting uh, stable in 129, we're looking at really enhancing all of these, um, you know, bringing all these benefits as part of V2. So starting from 127, instead of uh, generating a data encryption key every for sing, every single encryption request, uh, we now actually have a uh, data encryption key reuse. So what that means is you could actually reuse the same data encryption key uh, without having to go through that extra hop, right? Uh, and that roughly translates to 80 microsecond per request, which is, uh, sounds a lot better. Uh, so that meant, you know, you no longer have a slow startup for your API server. Uh, and uh, also we added, you know, health check and, and status as, their, as its own API. Um, so you can actually check the status of the plugin without having to encrypt or decrypt. Uh, and observability, right? Um, a new UID was added so that you could actually correlate between all the different three actors. Uh, and then also there's a new protoform map that was introduced uh, 
being stored as part of SCD. So when you look at the SCD data, you actually know which key encrypt encryption key was used, what the data encryption key was used. Uh, and last but not least, there's also, because we actually keep the key ID as part of the status API, you can actually now rely on that information to help you decide when you can in rotate the key. Um, and because uh, deck reuse it is part of the, um, uh, the, the plugin can actually tell the API server, hey, I, I wanna use a new key encryption key and therefore that key ID can be used to tell the API server now go ahead and regenerate a new deck. Um, so for more information, go ahead and check out that link. Um, this is just the Kubernetes uh, website. Uh, and if you wanna get more involved, uh, please check out the Slack uh, channel. Uh, and here's an, uh, just kind of give you a, a look at what the actual proto looks like. Um, so as you can see, it's prefixed with uh, Kate's encryption KMS v2. Uh, and then the plugin name, uh, and then the object itself has the actual encrypted data, as well as the key encryption ID that was used, as well as the encrypted deck that was used, and any annotation that you wanna add to um, help you correlate the data. Um, a picture is worth a thousand words. And also, I really, it's really hard to explain this stuff uh, unless you've been working on it for a long time. Um, so just to kind of give you graphically, right, what happens when a user uh, sends a, uh, what, when a user actually creates a new object? Um, the request comes in and the API server says, hey, do I already have a, 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 d a data encryption key or not? And if it already has it, it's gonna use that to encrypt the data, uh, and then it's gonna store the encrypted data in, the S in SCD, right? Now, what happens if the deck doesn't already exist, right? Um, so when it generates the deck, uh, it basically sends the encryption uh, request to the plugin, and the plugin basically encrypts the deck with the remote key encryption key that is in the external KMS. And then once it encrypts the data encryption key, then all of that information is part of the response that gets returned back to the API server. Uh, and for a decrypt request, so like a get or a list, uh, same thing happens to the API server. It sends, uh, the, the API server retrieves the data from SCD, and if the encrypted data encryption key is already in cache, it's gonna use that to decrypt the resource. And if it doesn't already have it, it's gonna go uh, use the, um, the key encryption key ID to talk to the plugin and then retrieve the uh, information from the remote KMS to do the decryption of the data encryption key. See, it's really hard to <laughs> use. Um, and then again, we've done all the optimization so that we wanna make sure part of this journey it, anything you can cache, anything we can reuse, we will do it. Uh, and then last but not least, you know, we talked about the status request, right? The, as part of the status API, this is being used to check the health of the plugin, right? Um, so about every minute, it basically calls the, um, the status API to ensure that, hey, is the uh, plugin still healthy, and if not, uh, every 10 seconds or so, it basically checks is it uh, why it's unhealthy, uh, and they all, and the plugin also returns like, hey, here's the current key ID I'm using, and if if the remote KM, KMS gets rotated, it's going to return the new key ID to the API server, and then the API server will use the new key ID to generate a new uh, data encryption key. And with that. Thanks. So one of the features I'm really excited about that's coming, uh, being developed now is cluster trust bundles. So for a long time, we've had a certificate signing request API, and for a long time, we have punted on how can you actually trust the, how can you distribute trust for the certificates that are signed? And this is a mechanism to do that and to distribute whatever other trust you want in your cluster. Shown here is just what the API uh, roughly looks like. You have a, uh, an API resource with a signer name and a trust anchor, which is essentially your CA bundle. Uh, and the idea is that you'll be able to look up the signer that you want. So working through a practical example, um, the uh, example here would be if you have a certificate signing request and you have a particular signer that is signing it, um, 
trusting the QAPI server, you can now look up the CA bundle to verify it. And you can either do that, currently you can do it manually, um, but coming soon, we will have a way to have a projected volume. That PR is open. Um, it's got some more reviews outstanding on it. Um, but when that merges, you'll be able to have it injected into your pod and it will let you set up essentially your own schemes. You'll be able to either get ones that already exist, if they get published, uh, or you can create your own signer and say, for my app, uh, I want to sign requests with this signer. I'll have some mechanism for doing it. Now, further in the future, there is a plan to actually have a way to identify individual workloads. Uh, and it's a pre-kept stage. I've linked it here in the slides, which should get published, so you can click the link later. Uh, and you can read through it. I'm expecting a cap probably in 128, I'd say. Um, and I'm really excited for that because it sort of then tells a whole story about how you can have pods communicate and trust each other in a fairly easy flow. Uh, there are a couple other designs that are still under, uh, still in design stages. Uh, the structured authorization config is one that is going to allow us to have multiple webhooks. So, so right now you can have a webhook and you cannot have more than one and that limits what you're able to do. Uh, this is gonna allow us to inject, uh, say a deny authorizer uh, ahead of RBAC if you want it and have an allow based authorizer afterwards. There's some details around how we can have uh, a good failure policy for deny authorization that's early in the chain. Uh, and if you, if you look here, you can see there's an example of uh, cell expressions, which are looking like the way to do it. Cell is coming in from API machinery. Uh, if you're following what's happened with CRDs or with validating admission, uh, it'll be familiar uh, in its usage here. Uh, and I can see this being really useful uh, as you go into your deployments. Another piece of structured configuration is OIDC. Uh, so, you know, we have limitations today around you can have one uh, OIDC provider. This is going to let us get to more than one. Uh, and it's going to, again, allow dynamic reload. Um, and it will also allow you to do some more advanced mapping steps. And cell is everywhere. Uh, so if uh, I should have actually included a link to cell in general. Maybe we can update the slides before we publish them. Um, but uh, it'll allow you to do some more advanced mapping features based on a cell expression. Um, you're going to want to be sure you get it right in your authentication stack. Um, there's some examples here of the things you're going to be able to do. It'll be mappings and validation sort of rules. Uh, and with that, I'll hand this back over to Jordan. Uh, so there's another in-process uh, design that you may have actually heard references to in some of the other talks. Uh, I think uh, some of the SIG network gateway folks were talking about this, and maybe some of the SIG storage folks as well. Um, so the ability to uh, describe references across namespaces has been something that's come up repeatedly over the years. And we've always uh, sort of just said, namespaces are the permission boundary, uh, don't cross namespaces, um, which to, as a starting point, has, has not been bad. We've actually gotten a lot of a lot of mileage out of that. It's relatively easy to understand, uh, but it does leave gaps uh, in scenarios where you actually have different actors who belong in different namespaces, but still want to explicitly grant access. And so, Sig Network came up with an example of this, where you know a gateway is living in one namespace. So the administrator for that uh, has its own namespace appropriately. Uh, but then you have individual users managing their own services, wanting to provide certificates for use by that gateway, and they're in their own namespace. And so how should these two actors collaborate? And what SIG Network came up with was the idea of a reference grant. So the user with the secret in their own namespace uh, is going to record the intent to uh, grant access to their secret to some other gateway. And they give very specific coordinates. This secret to that ingress, or that gateway, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so th this was useful. They, they implemented this as a, as a custom resource, um, got a lot of use out of it. 
Uh, and then Sig Storage said, oh, well, we have something similar. Like we have uh, volume snapshots and uh, persistent volume claims, and we have a similar cross namespace thing we want to model. Can we use your API? And Sig Network said, well, sure, but it's weird for Sig Storage to use a Sig Network API, and isn't this all Sig Auth's responsibility? Um, and so they showed up with this API and a request to uh, bring this in as a Sig Auth owned API, um, which we appreciate. That's great. Two use cases is a great thing to have before you start abstracting something. Um, so we took a look at what they had, and Reference Grant is a really good way to capture the intent of the user who wants to give access to a resource. Uh, but there are a couple other pieces of the puzzle. There's the controller, the gateway controller, the volume controller. How does it actually get authorized to, to get this secret or get this volume snapshot or whatever the resource is? And so there was a question about authorization there. Uh, and then finally, uh, how does the controller author uh, indicate when they get a secret that they're doing it on behalf of this thing? And so um, what SIG Network came up with with Reference Grant was a good piece of that solution. And we're looking, uh, we had some great discussions this week. I'm actually really excited about it. Um, we're looking to sort of expand what they did with this reference grant to also have ways for the controller to indicate what it's making the request on behalf of and for the administrator to avoid needing to just give broad permissions to the controller. Um, so as we sort of bring this into SIG off and look to make it a generic thing that uh, lots of controllers can make use of, uh, we're hoping to sort of holistically solve that whole problem. The user intent to allow, the controller ability to access, and the administrator's ability to give that controller the most scoped privileges uh, it can. Do you want to talk through this? Yeah. Um, right. Here, yeah. Um, and like every other SIG, uh, we, we have a lot of cross-SIG work. Um, I mean, you just mentioned a bunch of SIG networking thing. Slide, yeah. That's true. Um, but we actually work very closely with API machinery. Uh, specifically, you know, we mentioned cell for mission uh, and then storage version API as well as cube API server identity, um, just to name a few. And uh, last but not least, we want to give a, a huge shout out to all the contributors who uh, have really been helping us drive all these enhancements in SIG auth. Um, and we could not have done this without them. Thank you so much. And in case you're wondering how you can get involved, <laughs> um, we have a Slack channel uh, in the Kubernetes uh, Slack, as well as a homepage with all the detailed information for how you can get involved, when are the meetings. Um, we also have a SIG uh, auth triage meeting every Monday morning uh, for U.S. Pacific time if you want to join that. Also, we have a mailing list if you have questions or issues. Um, obviously, there's uh, GitHub issues. Uh, and then also, we have a biweekly meeting uh, where uh, we meet uh, Wednesday, 11 p.m., 11 a.m. Pacific time, uh, where we talk about all the interesting things that we're doing and where you can bring your designs as well. With that, um, I think that's it. Yeah, thank you. So we did want to leave some time for questions. I think we've got a couple mics. Um, and so if you have questions, raise your hand. A mic will find you. Uh, for the mobile folks or remote folks, uh, we'll be looking on Slack if you have questions there. So open it up. Hi. Uh, nice presentation. Um, I have a somewhat um, slightly tangential question. Uh, so we use EKS a lot, and what we found is that uh, AWS is on one hand good at authentication, and on the other hand very bad, because if you use EKS and you want to do any th sort of integration, uh, which you would normally do on the control plane, so on your uh, control plane nodes, uh, you of course do not have access to your control plane on EKS. So I was wondering, is there any, uh, uh, are there any thoughts floating around about interacting with authentication without having access to your control plane, if you want to manipulate or plug in or in any other way uh, influence it. I mean, it would obviously be very hard because, well, if you could do that, that would also be a security hole, but yeah. what do we do? 
I think I think Mo seated the uh, seated the audience. Um, so a, a couple of the things: the the ability to have more than one OIDC authenticator, the ability to have more than one authorization webhook, uh, and the ability to uh, respond to changes in that configuration dynamically, are building blocks that would be necessary to support something like that. Whether a particular managed provider would actually expose control over that is you know, totally up to them, but uh, those are building blocks that would absolutely support something like that in a much more seamless way. So that's, that's what we're fo focusing on now. Those benefit everyone and would enable providers who wanted to give control over that. Yeah, yeah that was, what I was pretty much what I was hoping as well. Um, it's just up to the managed providers, of course, as it always is. Exactly. But uh, yeah, it's at least I was on the right track there. It, it Thank you. It has to land in uh, Kubernetes first. Yeah, of course, of course. And then it takes about 10 years before it lands in EKS. <laughs> well, but at some point it might be possible, which uh, is good news. Uh-oh. Uh <laughs> Hi. So I'm one of the other uh -huh. leads for SIGAuth. Is this on? No. Should be. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so just a quick thing on top of what they said. So like, let's see, I know there's EKS folks here, but like, yeah. so EKS does let you configure OIDC with all the limitations of the current OIDC support. Mm -hmm. uh, but back when I was at VMware, I did build a little project called Pinniped that you can run on top of your EKS cluster. So if you want to bypass any of those restrictions, just run it. And it does. <laughs> and I wrote it, so I'm pretty sure it's right. So Nice, thanks. Uh, I'll also say that like, some, it's possible that some providers are currently using the, the one webhook or the one OIDC integration we support currently uh, for their own IAM or their own OIDC. And so uh, it's possible that they would actually be willing to support more, but they're using the one slot already. So um, for ones that don't want to open it up, they don't have to. For ones that do want to, but are currently limited by the one slot, this would help them. Hi, um, thanks for the, the really good presentation. Um, so one quick question on the, the kind of configurations that you had, the, the component configurations, are they files on disk or, and reloadable? Yeah, they're gonna be files on disk and they will be hot reload. Uh, so you know, within a nice. minute it'll pick it up and, and then use it for you. Okay, perfect. And uh, is there any plans on the kind of there's cluster role aggregation and that kind of stuff, but is there any, so not related at all to the previous, yeah, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> there's a second question. Um, so uh, cluster role aggregation exists, but is there any uh, kind of idea or, or kind of progress on uh, role aggregation? So not kind of on the cluster wide scope. Um. I didn't have any immediate plans. Mm. Uh, if you are interested in it, I think we would model it differently. I think we would agree that we would probably model it differently. Mm. Uh, but if there was a use case for it, maybe. The difference is that we share broad cluster roles that are run inside of each namespace. But if you get down to the level of creating your own role in a namespace, mm. you generally know the ones that you created and it's local to you. So there wasn't as obvious a need when we made mm. the original. Okay, cool. Thanks. Last session, last day. Is anyone still awake? <laughs> There's a hand. Do you have any uh, thoughts or plans around a V2 secrets API that doesn't expose a secret content in lists? Um, the, it's not the first time the question's been asked. It, the, the hard thing is um, it's not just a V2 secrets API, it's a different kind of Kubernetes API. So it's almost a V2 Kubernetes, um, which is a bigger lift. Um, so uh, there aren't any plans right now. Um, some of the conversations this week were talking about uh, additional um, possibilities for things we could authorize on. So listing with uh, restricted to particular selectors, field selectors, label selectors. Um, there are abilities to list uh, with particular content types. So you can list and say, I only want metadata, uh, but obviously we don't authorize on the content type you accept. And so um, if you give someone list permission, they can use the full list or the metadata only list. Um, if we start talking about additional inputs to authorization, that 
could be one we consider. Even metadata only, though, is pretty suspect since that includes annotations, which often get confidential information serialized into them. So it's, there's not a clear path there. It's not really on our radar right now. Yeah. But I really am interested in trying to authorize on some additional fields. So show up at a couple of meetings when we talk about it. I, oh, yeah, there's one at the front. Let's go. Hi, thank you. Wonderful presentation. Um, I appreciate this list of where people can find you, and I would love to hear from one or more or each of you, which place do you think it would be really awesome for a new contributor to jump in? Maybe it's one of the specific bugs, or maybe it's one of the documentation gaps, or maybe it's one of the new features, but I, I would love to hear where you think a new person could uh, really jump in and do something interesting. Um, I'll start first. I, I think for a lot of the features that are in stable, I think that's a really good place to start to try it and then report bugs uh, or you know documentation because um, I think a lot of times we're too close to the solution. It's hard for us to see what's missing. Um, like for example, with the KMS v2 stuff, by having other people try it, we realize there are bugs that we didn't think of. So, uh, and documentation, right? We always need more documentation. So, um, so I definitely think stable and uh, implemented uh, caps are a great place to start. And also, uh, come to the meetings. Uh, a lot of times, we're looking for feedback as well, right? Uh, I'll say that I think some of where you want to start depends on what you want to do. So if you want to come in and report a bug and fix a bug, triage meeting is a great spot for you, right? Uh, if you want to come in and say, hey, I really want an integration like this, something on a mailing list with you know, a fairly crisp description of what it is you're doing or maybe even a prototype showing something sort of like this is a great place to start. And then from there, maybe, uh, maybe the SIG meeting. Um, Hand off anything to add, Jordan? Or? Um, I was just going to add sort of a third category. If you are looking to integrate, uh, giving feedback on designs um, while they're still in progress, it's way easier to accommodate feedback before we build a thing than after we've, like, it's in beta and the shape of it's pretty fixed. Uh, and so some of the things we talked about uh, today, um, especially things like reference grant that are still, like, we have a couple of use cases, but you could imagine many more. Um, please look at the things that are coming up and think about whether they solve a need that you have uh, or if they're close to solving a need but don't quite or you're not sure. Like, jump in during the design and feedback phase. Um, it's, it's way easier to accommodate tweaks or at least consider use cases we hadn't at that point. And the spot to do that would probably be Slack channel, mailing lists, PR comment. Um, if you know of a particular design, the, the enhancements repo, there's an issue with the number. When Anytime you see a kep number, 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 that's an issue in the enhancements repo, and there should be links from there to the design. Uh, if you don't know what you're looking for, yeah, Slack or the mailing list is a good place to start. And every one of the slides has a kep number to it, and it's linked to that kep. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, so another one for me. Um, uh, the trust bundles for the certificates. Uh, initially, this is intended for issuing certificates. Um, but if you take it the other way around, say you federate two clusters, maybe not really on cluster level, but perhaps on Istio level, and you want them to be able to trust each other's CA, um, Istio, of course, sets up its own CA, because why have one if you can have two? Uh, would it be possible to store that CA with maybe intermediate CAs into a chain, into a trust bundle, and then read that from the other cluster, so that way you can exchange CA information. Yes, that is definitely possible. Uh, and there are also spots, if you go and look at that enhancement, for where we would be referencing cluster bundle uh, or cluster trust bundle names or signers for use in other APIs. So uh, I would definitely suggest you have a look. Uh, just didn't fit in the margin. Yeah, yeah. the one place where it currently breaks, uh, Istio rewrites uh, probes and health checks because uh, otherwise the uh, health checker wouldn't trust the CA that is uh, applied by Istio. So what it does is uh, it captures all your traffic except your probes because otherwise it wouldn't be able to successfully probe your pods. 
but with this, it would essentially be able to say, well, it's been signed by the CA, and here's the resource representing that CA, and now you can trust it, so you don't need to do any rewrites anymore, which would yeah. be neat. I th if I followed all that verbal description <laughs> properly, uh, then, then I think we're thinking along the same lines, but the comment about it's a lot easier to change this before something goes beta, now's your opportunity. It went out as alpha in like 127, so uh, go ahead and give that thing a try and let us know. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all for being here. I'm amazed that you all are here, and I'm happy to see you all. Thank you for coming to the conference.